boy, how did I get that wrong? Does your analysis suck? Do you have trouble calculating the most basic variations? Well, check out part three of my Skyrocket Your Chess Understanding. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part three of Skyrocket Your Chess Understanding. Today, we're going to start with a basic tactical position just to warm up, and then we're going to go into a game where I give you five basic prompts during the game to test your thought process and try to figure out what the masters did and then learn immediately if you got it right or wrong. So let's get started. So this is the basic position with white to move. And I chose this position because I thought it was very interesting. And it took me, it took me a hot minute to figure out <laughs> the final solution. So let's get into it. If you want to pause the video, now's the time to do that and think for yourself. Now, remember, you want to find your opponent's threats. You want to find your possibilities. You want to calculate all the possibilities and be thorough and systematic. And then you want to do a blunder check to make sure you're not making a mistake. So follow those and we'll get into it. So first we want to just look, and the reason you want to do this is because you want to get in the habit of finding all your opponent's possibilities, because even if you see the solution right away, if you have the habit of just playing a move when you see an answer in your mind, you're going to make a lot of blunders and be frustrated with your lack of chess progress because you're making stupid blunders. You see, I see it all the time. So let's get into it. So black is threatening the bishop and the pawn. He's also threatening this d5 pawn with the knight too. So we'll see those threats and notice this check over here too of the queen on the king. So you want to notice all the forcing possibilities even if they seem kind of random and unimportant. Now we're going to look at our possibilities. You'll notice just from our general understanding, remember we want to go general to specific, we're going to look at all of the general possibilities first. You can see that the rook is controlling the e-file and the king is kind of sitting over here surrounded by white's pieces. So generally we want to conclude that we're trying to make an attack and hopefully find a mate. All right, so we have this rook over here, this bishop here. They could come into the attack if we had time, but we really want to find checks, then captures, and then threats. So in that order. So there's two checks here, well actually three with the with the knight, uh, but we want to find the queen check. There's two checks here on g7 and g6, and then there's a knight check here. So we want to look at all of these, and you want to quickly discount them. This is why you need to be systematic. All right, so queen takes, rather ridiculous, but the bishop can take, we can check here, but actually after here, he can come back and instead of moving there, we could win the queen, but we have to evaluate it as a piece down because after we finally take here, let's see, we can move here, take. So we'll evaluate that as not a good move. And he could even come here and we get the check here and then the queen comes and then we lose even more material. All right, so let's go back here. So queen takes uh, g7. You know, this is what I'm talking about when you need to get in the habit because of course queen takes g7 looks ridiculous, but sometimes those moves result in a very surprising and cool win. So now we're gonna look at queen to g6. Notice that the pawn can take, but this is where you need visualization skills because you need to see that the rook and the knight, actually it's a checkmate because the pieces of black cover all the squares. All right, so we can evaluate that as a win. And what would black do after? So this is where your calculation and visual, visualization skills come in and you have to develop them, but you can do it during the exercise. So obviously the king would move. And now it looks like we have a bunch of possibilities with a discovered attack and we need to evaluate all of them. So the knight, Basically, we need to calculate all these moves and discount them as quickly as possible. All right, so if we get a check here, then 
You need to remember that the pawn is threatening the queen. And actually, if the knight came back, we could take here. And we have this calculation line. And the only other move is either take and then check. So we do win. But let's go back here. So there's actually a simpler win. And it took me, this is the one it took me a hot minute to see. So, oh, all right, we already analyzed that. So if the king goes over, we see there's actually this deflection check here. And the only possibility is king takes and then checkmate. So it's actually a mate in three uh, from the beginning. A very interesting position. And actually it put me through the ringer when it comes to finding these kind of random moves, but I was systematic about it. And with that systematic approach, you'll find moves like queen to f7 in your analysis. Whereas if I was just relying on pattern recognition, I might not have seen it. All right, so let's go back to this. So after king moves here, you look at these checks again, check here, check here, and you can discount moves like queen to uh, e8 pretty quick, rook takes, or even just king takes. And then the queen will come after the discovery, like this. So obviously when you're practicing it, it's kind of slow, but it speeds up when you're going through the process and when you get more practice with it. And you can do it very quickly, even in blitz. But you do need to ingrain this process to find moves like queen to f7. All right, so just covering that position, thought it was very interesting. Leave a comment below of what you think of this position. And we're gonna get into the game. I'll see you there. In this game, I'm gonna cover a kingside attack that was played in 1925 between Richard Reddy as white and Alexander Alakine as black. Now, the interesting thing about a lot of chess commentary, YouTube videos, uh, books, magazines, is that they give you a lot of the moves, but they don't really cover the fact that during a game, you have to make decisions on every single move and that's really the difficulty and the disconnect between chess learning and actually playing the game. So that's what I'm trying to address with this course. Now I'm gonna give you five prompts during this game where I want you to think for yourself, but what I really want to teach is the interconnection of the thought process and the moves that follow. Because chess is really a strategic game and you need to understand uh, that your analysis and strategy need to be one, your chess understanding plus analysis. So let's just get into it. All right, so Ready starts with G3, kind of a hyper-modern idea of controlling the center with pieces instead of pawns. Alakine starts with E5, and we already see Knight to F3 attacking that E5 pawn. So I want you to pause the video, this is prompt one, and think for yourself what you would do and how you would develop. All right, so in a rather comical fashion, we see e4, kind of a reverse Alakine defense, with actually he's threatening the knight, and he does cede the d4 square to ready, but this is actually an educational point that I wanna make in this game already. So the main idea, the main thing that you need to focus on chess, or in chess, is attack. Now attack has two benefits. It reduces your opponent's activity and it increases your activity. That's the main thing behind attack. And it's actually psychologically easier to attack than defend because when you attack, you chase your opponent's pieces back and you push your pieces forward and make a bunch of threats. So it sounds again, basic, but that's actually a very high level thing to understand is you always need to be attacking. And when your opponent makes a threat, for example, on the E5 pawn, you need to figure out how you can attack him instead of just responding to all their threats. Because when you're responding, then that's when you start to get in trouble in chess. All right, from here we see D5, and then white is starting to attack the built up center. Now Alakine just takes and this is another educational point, is that when there's contact between the pieces, you don't just wanna trade because there can actually be a lot of trades that don't benefit you and actually help your opponent to increase their activity. So even though this is Alakine, you still need to analyze from the general understanding to improve your own. 
So as you can see, he took there. Now let's go back. So after d3 attacking e4, he could have played knight to f6. And just because Alakine plays that move doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, the best move possible. So even these great masters can make mistakes. Takes. All right, knight to f6. And then we see he brings the bishop out. He could have played something like c5, chasing that knight back. But he wants to just develop his pieces and start an attack in the center and on the king's side. Now, white brings his bishop out to contest the bishop, but actually he could have played something like c3, and then black would have had to just bring his bishop back. But instead we see a trade, castles, and now white decides to launch an attack before he's fully developed. Now, this is prompt two, and I want you to pause the video and think about how you would develop here as black and what your following moves would be. All right, so in this specific position, Alakine decides to go for knight to a6. Now the moves that follow are pretty logical and follow from his idea of knight to a6. Now he could have played something like, let's go back here, he could have played something like knight to c6, but actually after takes, takes, he's kind of made a target for himself on the queen side. So with knight to a6, white actually helps black by taking Alakine's idea was probably either to come here or most likely come knight to c5 and then get this knight in the center and as forward as possible and then all he has to do is bring the bishop in. Uh, but actually white helped him again with a trade. Now he hits the queen. And you can see that Alakine has solved all of his developmental difficulties with this knight. And instead of having the knight say on b6 or c6, now he can actually play c6 pawn and keep these two knights as well as the bishop in very advantageous positions for the middle game. All right, so white is again, he probably should have castled. He probably could have even castled something like queenside, which would have been risky, but instead he makes another move with the minor piece. And now Alakine just consolidates his d5 knight. He activates one of his inactive rooks, and he's also looking to play in the center. So this is a strategic idea. First, before you start a wing attack, you have to play in the center, and that's exactly what he's doing here. He's trying to create weaknesses in the center, and he's attacking the e2 pawn. So strategically, Reddy's idea is to play in the center and play on the queen side. And actually, Alakine, unless he plays active, he'll have kind of a difficult time just to drum up a kingside attack. So he starts with bishop to g4, hitting the e2 pawn. Ready defends it. And here is the third prompt. So I want you to think about what you would do here and how you would develop the game. Now, again, I want to make a point that when you're actually thinking about or learning from chess games, you'll see the moves, but you need to figure out how you would think and how the master thought in that position. And a lot of the moves that followed actually are from that one moment in time. It's not just like they just come up with a bunch of random moves every single move. So think here in this critical position and figure out what you would do. All right, so Alakine, he wants to start a kingside attack because the center is basically well defended and there's no progress he can make. And actually, strategically, he's in a quite difficult position because white doesn't have too many weaknesses uh, and he's gonna bring the knight to c5, he's gonna bring his rooks in and then he's gonna play the b pawn up and create a bunch of weaknesses on the queen side. And strategically, Alakine can't really do anything about it and it's hard to defend. So he decides to play actively and his move queen to c8, obviously he doesn't want to play queen to d7 because knight to c5 is coming anyway. And Alakine goes for the idea of undermining the king's side. And this is another point I want to make is that when you're in the middle game, which now we're in the middle game because all the pieces are developed, you have to start an attack. And the way you do that is you attack your opponent's weak points. Now, the weak point in 
White's camp is actually, if he can trade this dark square bishop, he'll have a bunch of weak light squares. So that's Alokhine's main idea of starting this kingside attack. So he plays bishop in, and Ruddy has the correct idea to not allow it. So we see kind of a repetition. And Ruddy probably could have got a draw here um, because actually there's really nothing that Alokhine can do. But he plays the bishop all the way back, and he lets the game continue. All right, so then we see h5. Now, this is a move that actually, when I was analyzing, the, analyzing this game, I found a little bit hard to find initially because I thought, okay, how is he going to progress the game? And it is quite difficult. But you can see that if there's no weakness, you have to create the weakness. And this is actually what masters have to do in these games because a lot of times your opponent's not just going to make a blunder or make a bunch of weaknesses for himself. So you actually need to find a way to undermine and create create specific points of attack for yourself. And Alakine's idea is to just trade a pawn and create another weakness in the king side. And again, Reddy's probably strategically won in this game, so Alakine knows that and he needs to play actively. All right, so he's trying to slow down, or at least if white plays here and then trades, at least he'll get an active rook, even though it's kind of a difficult position on the queen side. All right, so Alokhine decides to just ram ahead, and he's going to trade. And we see the center is completely consolidated, but we're following the strategy for each player. Takes, takes, and now we see... Queen to c7. So there's no progress to be made in the game further with the queen here. And he's finally connected the rooks. But what is the main strategic idea behind this move? Obviously, he needs to shift to create more weaknesses on the king side. And his idea is to undermine this square and this pawn. Now, there's really nothing that Reddy can do about the king side attack. But there's also nothing that Alakine can do about the weakening of his queen side. So we see b5. He takes, and then he just maintains the tension. But the reason he took is because he wants this active file for his rook. So this is prompt four. <laughs> and I want you to pause the video and really take your time, because this is the critical moment in the game. So all the moves have led up to this point, and we see that if Alakine doesn't do something, what White's going to do is he's going to trade on c6. He's going to win a pawn, and then he's just going to overrun the camp with his extra pawn, trade into a one endgame, and it's just going to peter out into a loss for Alakine. So you really need to think actively in these positions. And this is why sometimes translating tactics to real games is hard, because nobody's announcing these moves. And this is why you have to be systematic in your thought process. So first off, you need to understand your opponent's threats. So we know strategically what's happening in the game. Second off, you need to find your main ideas. So mo mostly focus on your own ideas. And in this specific game, Alakine's trying to start a kingside attack and undermine basically the entire kingside pawn structure. So how can he do that? We see that black has all of the minor pieces are aiming towards the king side, but there's really no there's really no specific move that breaks through. So what you need to do is you need to find your least active piece and bring it into the attack. So how can we do that? Well, in this specific position, rook to e3 is a very strong move. Uh, although it's not winning immediately, there if if Reddy actually played bishop to f3, he could have defended. But that's another point, is that when you're defending, you have to look at so many different moves that it's quite hard. And you actually make your opponent's uh, position a lot harder than yours because they're having to spend all their time to find your threats, whereas you're just trying to find attacking moves. So from this position, I'm not, I'm not necessarily expecting people to solve the entire position. I'm not saying you're going to be calculating like Alakine, but what I want you to do is to be able to find all the contact between the pieces and try to calculate it the best of your abilities. So the main threat here 
obviously you want to calculate pawn takes rook, right? Now we see that that undermines the g3 pawn. Queen can take, and we see an immediate mate here if the king moves. So you, you want to be able to calculate these basic tactics. You see that all of these complicated calculations is a basic result of knowing basic tactics. So if the bishop interposed, then there's nothing that white can do after knight takes e3. Basically the only way to defend it would be queen, and then we just take. There's nothing that can be done. There's gonna be a mate. So that analysis concludes that white cannot take that rook, and we also have the threat of rook takes g3 anyway, forcing the issue. So this is where it gets really complicated. So Reddy decides to defend with knight to f3. Rather a blunder, but this is gonna lead into prompt five, and I'm not gonna expect you to solve necessarily this whole position, but, because it's very complicated, I'll say that. But I do want you to see how you would enter this game where we went from a very simple kind of opening all the way into a strategical middle game and a kingside attack, all of a sudden into one of the most complicated chess positions that we're going to see. Now, I want you to take your time and try to calculate how you would win from here. I'm not saying you'll see the whole solution, but it's great practice to try to calculate and see in these real game scenarios how you would solve it. Not necessarily like a puzzle, but to try to systematically figure out everything. So pause the video and do that now, and let's get into it. What I would do from here is you wanna calculate not every single move necessarily, but you wanna understand the position from pawn takes rook and then queen takes. So that allows you to make a lot of different moves to try to bring more pieces into the attack. So that's our general understanding. In this position, we wanna bring as many pieces into the attack to make it as successful as possible. And we're gonna calculate a bunch of moves to figure out how to do that. So an attacking move here that Alakine made was pawn takes. And then that allowed him to play knight takes. So now he can bring the knight in, and obviously if the rook takes, then he just wins the exchange, and he's gonna suffer all of a sudden a very rough kingside attack. So the queen takes the pawn, and Alakine decides actually to take here. Take, take. So the kingside attack is rather over, but now this allows him to win a bunch of material. And let's see how this proceeds. So first we see knight fork. Obviously if the rook takes, then he wins an exchange. What would you do here? The rook is now all of a sudden threatened by the pawn. But Alakine goes ahead and brings another piece in. Now all of a sudden, if we see takes here, then after knight takes, the rook is threatened as well as this piece. So if he takes, then we just take here. And it's game over. So you could see that when you have a lot of contact between the pieces, you're gonna have to look at a bunch of different moves, but actually if you do it systematically, it makes your position a lot easier. All right, so now white is threatening, all of a sudden threatening this knight, but he can take here, luckily. <laughs> this is a very complicated position, I know. Attack, check. Now that's a discovered check. So he calculated that if the knight comes here, here, and then all of a sudden this active rook comes into play and it's game over, he loses at least a piece. So that's why he couldn't go back there. So he, he has to step into this discovered check. Now if the bishop took, and black is up a piece. 
check. You could see that even Reddy was not able to get through all of these complications. Otherwise, he wouldn't have entered this line. Uh, but check takes. And then we see a simplification and crystal clarity in the position. This is where Reddy resigned the game. And can you see why? This is maybe a, a ghost six prompt. Here, takes, and then we see a perfect bishop fork of the rook, and the rook obviously can't go there and defend the knight. So he wins a whole piece and a pawn, and it was game over. And the other complication here, he can't bring the knight in because it's actually check, and he wins a piece anyway. Mm -hmm.